Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for, for joining us today for SRUK's March webinar entitled Systemic Sclerosis and the Gastrointestinal Tract. My name's Helena. I'm just your host for, for this session. Um, I can see that we have almost 90 attendees and the number is growing. So thank you all for, for being with us today. We are truly delighted to be joined by our expert speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Volkman. Dr. Volkman is an active clinical and translational researcher in both systemic sclerosis and interstitial lung disease. She is Associate Professor of Medicine and Scleroderma Program Director with the Division of Rheumatology at the University of California in Los Angeles. Dr. Volkman pioneered the first study to investigate the gut microbiome in patients with systemic sclerosis and now leads an international consortium of investigators dedicated to understanding how the, the microbiome contributes to inflammation and clinical symptoms. She is also involved in clinical trials to help identify new therapies. So our webinar today is essentially in two parts. We'll, we'll begin in a moment with a presentation from Dr. Volkman. Following this, in the second half of our webinar, Dr. Volkman will be taking your questions and you can send these via the Q&A function um, on the window. And we will do our best to get through as many as we can during the time that, that, that we have available. I am now delighted to hand over to our expert speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Volkman. Um, who, um, good morning, I think, Dr. Volkman. <laughs> you, can you hear me okay? hear you thank you okay thank you so much for that nice introduction and i want to thank the sruk for organizing these webinars i think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to all connect from different parts of the world and i'm delighted to speak on a topic that i feel like doesn't often get a lot of attention for patients with systemic sclerosis and that is the gi tract um, there was a lot of content to fit into this short amount of time that we have today um, so we're going to spend about half the time going through my slides and the presentation, and then we wanted to leave plenty of time for all of your questions. So again, this is a lot to cover in this short amount of time, but I encourage you, you can uh, write your questions down in the chat and then we'll get to them at the end of the talk. Um, again, so my name is Elizabeth Volkman and I'm in Los Angeles, so it's morning time here. <laughs> So the presentation outline is we're going to review um, GI tract involvement in systemic sclerosis, how we diagnose it, and also ways to manage symptoms. And when we think about GI tract involvement in systemic sclerosis, it's helpful to understand that any part of the GI tract can be involved, beginning in the mouth, going down into the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestine, as well as the rectum. And you may be wondering what percentage of patients have involvement of the GI tract. And when we look at different regions of the GI tract, there's a different prevalence. So for example, the esophagus is usually involved in up to 90% of patients. Um, a smaller percentage of patients will have stomach involvement. When we look at the lower GI tract, so this would be the large intestine, the small intestine, you can see that it, there's a kind of a broad range depending on what studies you look at. But then the rectum is 50 to 70%. So, you know, when I think about all the different manifestations of systemic sclerosis, after the skin, the GI tract is actually the second most common organ system that's involved in systemic sclerosis. So this is a big problem and it can affect patients quality of life. So these symptoms can be very disruptive and many of you on the webinar today may experience some of these symptoms and know firsthand that it can compromise lifestyle, emotional well-being, again, as well as quality of life. So now we're going to focus on upper GI involvement and go through some of the symptoms that patients can experience. And not everyone will experience every symptom that I list here, but these are the most common ones that I see in my practice. So when the mouth is involved, sometimes patients can have difficulty opening their mouth. And this is usually because they have tightening of their skin of their face that restricts the opening of the mouth. Um, there also can be changes that happen in the mandible, so the, the, basically the jawbone, the joints that connect the jawbone to the skull. This can also shift in terms of mouth opening. 
We also see decreased salivary flow. And what this means is that when you normally chew or eat food, you should produce saliva to help you digest food. And sometimes patients with scleroderma have decreased salivary flow. We can see blood vessel changes that happen in the mouth and sometimes ulcers can appear. And then patients, especially as the disease progression, can have something called tooth resorption um, where they can actually lose teeth. So what are the symptoms? So patients can have difficulty chewing. Um, dental caries are more common. So these, in other words, for this is cavities. So if you have dry mouth, it predisposes you to having dental caries. And then oftentimes patients can have difficulty with temperature sensitivity if the gums are involved as well. The esophagus though is something that really affects the majority of patients. As I mentioned, up to 90% of patients will have involvement. And really what happens is that there's um, dysmotility of the esophagus. So the muscle that helps to contract and move food down through the esophagus does not work properly. We also see that the bottom part of the esophagus, it's called the lower esophageal sphincter. This is something that's normally closed. Um, and when you eat, it opens so that food can pass through the esophagus into the stomach. Um, and then in scleroderma, what happens is it kind of stays relaxed and open all of the time. So you can imagine that if you're sitting upright, gravity will keep the contents of your stomach down. But if you recline or lay back or when you sleep, sometimes you can have the contents of the stomach, the acid come up into the esophagus. We also see the blood vessel changes in the esophagus, and this can cause something called esophagitis, which is inflammation in the esophagus. And then some patients can even have narrowing, so strictures in the esophagus that can make it difficult to swallow. So symptoms here, again, difficulty swallowing, acid reflux, heartburn, and then chronic cough. And, and this is something that's important to realize because oftentimes patients and even doctors, when you say that you have chronic cough, they automatically assume, well, this must be related to your lungs or maybe you have asthma or post-nasal drip. But really a common cause of chronic cough in scleroderma is acid reflux particularly if the cough is occurring after you eat or first thing in the morning after you've been lying down all night. When the stomach is involved, we can see delayed emptying. And what this means is that this, the contents of the stomach don't move out of the stomach fast enough and they, you kind of stay full longer. Um, we also see blood vessel changes in the stomach as well. And this can be a big problem um, when patients develop something called the watermelon stomach, which is a lot of in large blood vessels that can cause bleeding. So the symptoms, so if you have delayed gastric emptying, you'll feel early quicker. So we call this early satiety. You may have abdominal distension after eating, even nausea and vomiting in severe cases. And then if you do have the blood vessel changes in the stomach, the watermelon stomach, you're at risk for anemia because you'll start to lose blood and lose iron. How do we diagnose upper GI involvement? And this is an evolving area, I would say, of clinical practice in scleroderma, where we're trying to get better at early diagnosis of upper GI tract involvement, because oftentimes early in the course of scleroderma, the symptoms may not be there yet, or they may not be so apparent. So for the mouth, you know, all patients should have a very careful physical examination where the doctor looks inside the mouth. Um, certain labs can be done to look to see if patients have a predisposition for having dry mouth. And I've listed two here, um, SSA and SSB. These are two autoantibodies that we see sometimes in a condition called Sjogren syndrome. It's another autoimmune disease that's associated with dry eyes, dry mouth, and many patients with scleroderma will have this condition. Um, salivary gland ultrasound can sometimes be done, and then really dental evaluation is super important, and this has to be done on a regular basis. For the esophagus, we do something called upper endoscopy, and, and again, some of the terminology here may be slightly different than what you do in the UK, so I'll try to explain more in layman's turn, but an endoscopy is when um, the GI doctor typically looks down the esophagus with the camera and they can take biopsies if they need to and pictures to get a better look at the esophagus. A barium swallow is something where you're looking to see how, how the swallowing mechanism works and if there's any areas of narrowing or strictures. 
And then manometry is something where they're looking at the contraction of the muscles. So I mentioned that sometimes there's dysmotility of the esophagus. The manometry will tell you, are the muscles contracting at all? And if they are, where are they contracting? The upper part, the lower part, the mid part. And the stomach, we can also use the upper endoscopy. So looking down with a camera, and this can go down into the stomach again to look to see if there's changes in those blood vessels, if there's any bleeding, if there's something that needs to be biopsied. And then a gastric emptying study is where you're looking to see, do you have delayed gastric emptying? So typically this test will involve eating something um, that's radio labeled so that they can see when they do imaging where it is and how long it takes to get out of your stomach. So this is an example and maybe some of you have seen this when you've talked to your GI doctor or your rheumatologist, but this is an example of manometry. And when you see this on the left side here, UES, this stands for upper esophageal sphincter and then lower. So on this side here is what a normal patient without scleroderma would look like. And you can see that at the top of the esophagus, the scleroderma patient looks very similar. But then as you get lower down, you can see that there's not that contraction. And this is where, again, that lower part of the esophagus becomes very relaxed and doesn't really act as a proper barrier from keeping the stomachs of the, the contents of the stomach from coming up. This is kind of what an endoscopy will look like. And some of you also may have seen these reports. I know um, at my center, they actually print out the pictures to give the patients after their procedure. Um, so this here in panel A would be an example of normal, but you can see here, these are very enlarged blood vessels. This is an example of, of watermelon stomach or game where you get these enlarged blood vessels that can bleed. Again, other changes in blood vessels here. So the endoscopy really gives you a good picture. And you may wonder, well, who should get endoscopy who has scleroderma? I actually recommend both of these studies for all patients. So even patients who don't have symptoms, I think it's helpful to do these studies because they can clue you in because sometimes patients won't notice the symptoms, but if you identify this problem, you can intervene earlier. How do we treat these dimensions of scleroderma? So when the mouth is involved, we recommend regular dental hygiene visits. So this should really happen every three months. And this may seem excessive, but if you go every three months, they'll be able to address the problems more promptly. So for example, if you are predisposed to having the dental caries because of dry mouth, You'd rather have them get at it right away than wait to the point where you need a root canal or a tooth extraction. Um, eating soft foods is important. You know, a, a first step of digestion is something called mechanical digestion, and that's when you're chewing your food to make it more digestible. If you have difficulty with chewing, you're not going to be able to digest your food well if you're eating rough um, food. So soft foods can be very helpful like uh, pureed vegetables and soups. Um, Sugar-free lozenges can also help stimulate the salivary flow. Um, you don't want to have, uh, you know, hard candies full of sugar and suck on them in your mouth because that could increase your risk of having the dental caries. Um, I've listed a website here and I like the products on this website because they use um, xylitol as a sugar substitute. And this is something that in many studies has been demonstrated to actually reduce the risk of dental caries. And they have a variety of different types of hard candies and, and chocolate. There's a lot of options on here, but it's nice because they use the xylitol. And then sips of water can be helpful. So if you suffer from dry mouth, I always tell my patients, you know, keep a water bottle with you all the time, you know, have one next to your bed at night because sometimes patients at night, particularly if you breathe a lot through your mouth, the mouth can get very dry. So if you wake up in the night, have the water right there to take a sip of water so you can just go right back to sleep. And then there's certain medications that as a doctor, I prescribe to help manage these symptoms. So common ones are things called proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers. These essentially suppress acid production in the stomach, and so that way you're not getting the acid reflux that's coming up into the esophagus and causing inflammation. We're also starting to use more medications that improve the motility of the GI tract. 
So traditionally, some of you may have heard of um, metoclopramide. We don't use this one as much anymore because it has a lot of neurological side effects. Um, but I do use one called procalipride, um, and this is one that can actually improve both upper and lower GI tract motility. So um, we'll get to the lower GI tract soon, but again, this is another way to manage the symptoms of upper GI tract involvement. There's a host of lifestyle changes that as a patient you can make that might improve your symptoms and quality of life. So sleeping with the head of the bed can be um, elevated is really important. And there's different ways to achieve this. So sometimes patients can get a, a wedge pillar, pillow that keeps them elevated. Um, for other patients, that's uncomfortable and, and the wedge pillow ends up on the floor by the morning. Um, a simple thing you can do is get uh, bricks or some kind of a block to put under the head of the bed to just keep it on an angle because again, you're trying to help uh, gravity keep things down. And because you're sleeping for such a long time at night, you don't want to end up with reflux going on all night long. I would also recommend avoid eating um, anywhere less than three hours before you go to bed. If you do this, you have a greater chance of having the contents of the stomach not emptied by that point and then coming up into the esophagus. And we do do surgeries in severe cases and um, particularly in cases where we have a patient who let's say has uh, pulmonary fibrosis and they may need to get a lung transplant. We sometimes do a surgery before the transplant to really help get a control of the reflux. So this is an option for some patients. There's other nutritional suggestions and, and some of you may have seen some of the talks I've given on nutrition and GI tract involvement. Um, so these are some of the issues that I speak about with my patients. So many of you are probably aware of the foods that can trigger reflux because again, firsthand you're, you're living this experience. So fried food, uh, poor quality vegetable oils, red meat, coffee, hot spices, alcohol, citrus fruits, uh, tomatoes, particularly vinegar. These can be very aggravating. But there's also foods that you can incorporate more into your diet that could help minimize the symptoms. So soups can be really good, particularly not spicy soups, or vegetable soups. Um, oats, so oatmeal, gluten-free oats. Yogurts can also be kind of soothing for the esophagus. And again, if you can't um, have cow's milk, there's non-dairy yogurts that are helpful. Avocado, spinach, uh, cucumber, liquid chlorophyll is something you could add this to a smoothie. And then certain teas like chamomile tea could, could be helpful too. So these are some possibilities. And again, not all of these may work for you, but it's something worth exploring. And then when the stomach is involved, we typically recommend small frequent meals because the stomach empties more slowly. We don't want to overload it with food at one time. So if you suffer from delayed gastric emptying, you're going to want to be, instead of having three meals a day, you probably want to have six small meals a day. Um, the promotility agents can help with this. If there's anemia, iron repletion can be helpful. And then something that people may not always be aware of is that if you do lie on your side, you always want to try to lie, if it's comfortable, on your left side. And the reason being is that this is sort of the direction that the stomach would empty. It's also the direction that the colon moves. And so when you lie on your right side, you're actually gravity is working against that process. So again, if you're going to lie on your side, try to lie on your left side. Um, listen too to the signs when you're full. Your body will give you signals. When your stomach gets stretched, there's actually signals that get sent to your brain that tell you I'm full. There's no reason to push it beyond that point. What's a better measure is to wait a little bit and then try eating a little bit a couple hours later. If you push it too much, then you can end up with nausea, vomiting. And then I like to recommend that my patients take um, what I call digestive walks. And these are just gentle walks that you do after you eat. When you walk, you do stimulate the GI tract movement a little bit. And this can be helpful just to kind of get things going. I wouldn't recommend a vigorous walk or a very long walk, but this could be, you know, a 10 to 20 minute walk that you do after dinner. And it's also just a nice way to relax. So now let's move on to lower GI tract 
involvement, again, just being mindful of our time. Um, again, I showed this picture before, but just in more detail, the lower GI tract, we're talking about the colon, um, and we're talking about the small intestine and the rectum. So when the small intestine is involved, patients can have bacterial overgrowth. And what this means is that there's an imbalance in the healthy and not so healthy bacteria in the gut. Um, pseudo obstruction can also happen. And this is when the bowel uh, loops kind of can get twisted on themselves and create a blockage. And then the symptoms would be um, sometimes weight loss, distension and bloating. If you have bacterial overgrowth, oftentimes you can have, you're not absorbing your food as well, particularly fats, and that can change the way the stool smells or even the consistency of the stool. When the large intestine is involved, similar to the esophagus, you can have dysmotility. So things don't move quite as normally, and usually there's, there's slow transit motility. A malabsorption can also occur here, and the symptoms can vary. So many patients will have constipation, distension. Some patients will have more diarrhea. Others will have a combination of both, and then fecal incontinence can also occur. So when we try to understand if the small intestine is involved, we can do something called breath testing. And this can be a test to see if there's signs of bacterial overgrowth, again, that imbalance in the gut bacteria. There's other tests that we can do to look specifically at the intestine, so CT or MR enterography. Um, with the small intestine, you know, we can't get to it with a camera with endoscopy. So sometimes we do something called video capsule endoscopy, where you would swallow a pill that has a tiny little camera on it to be able to take pictures of certain parts of the small intestine. Sometimes we do this to help identify if there's any areas where there's those changes in the blood vessels that could cause bleeding. In the large intestine, we do colonoscopy. So it's similar to the endoscopy, but you're going from the other end. So going through the rectum, the doctor would look up with the camera to look at the colon. Um, colonic scintigraphy is similar in some sense to manometry, looking at how it moves, um, the motility. And then again, we can also do wireless motility capsules to look at large intestine motility patterns. And then finally, the anal rectum, there's anal rectal manometry. So again, looking at the contraction of the muscles of the rectum, um, ultrasound or MR can be done too. And sometimes we do this to see if there's atrophy or wasting away of these muscles. And then electromyography, again, just another, it's kind of a fancy word, but looking at the nerve functions in those areas. And this is an example of one lower GI study. This is actually just a plain radiograph. And I wanted to show it to you because this is an example of pseudo obstruction. So when the bowel loops get twisted, there's blockages. And you can see here, this dark matter here is actually an example of a, a rather big obstruction. The other things I'll just point out here and why we know this is a patient with scleroderma is that these upper arrows here, you can see there's this fine sort of white reticulation here. This patient also has pulmonary fibrosis. So this is the lower part of the lungs, again, the intestines. And then here are the hip bones. And then what's being demonstrated here, are these, these kind of like white deposits, and this is calcium. And it's actually in the iliac muscles. And so this is a classic case of a patient with scleroderma who's experiencing pseudo obstruction. So how do we treat small intestine involvement? So if you have bacterial overgrowth, it's helpful to adjust your diet and you want to reduce sugar and simple carb intake. And the reason being is that those bad bacteria that we think promote inflammation, they kind of feed off of these simple carbs. So you want to, you know, reduce this or exclude it entirely. Um, sometimes patients will tell me they'll be doing really well and then, you know, one more they'll have a pastry and then for the next few days they feel off. So if you can really try to eliminate anything with added sugar, simple carbs, breads. Um, we sometimes use antibiotics to treat bacterial overgrowth and rifaximine is one that can be very effective. Um, this I don't like to do long term in patients because it can sometimes then cause further disruption of the bacterial balance. But it's okay to do short term. Sometimes when you just have these episodes where you get really distended, you're not sure what triggered it, sometimes doing a two-week course of these antibiotics can be very helpful. 
And then we'll talk a little bit more about this, but to try to improve this balance, increasing foods rich in pre and probiotics can be helpful. For the large intestine, you know, again, because the slow motility is the defining feature of colonic involvement in scleroderma, we usually give patients pro-motility medications or laxatives. And, and this is important. I think that laxatives kind of have a stigma in society of being not so good to use on a regular basis. But I would say when you have scleroderma, you really need to have a daily bowel movement. If you're not having a daily bowel movement, you're not eliminating properly and toxins and different things can build up in the body. So try not to have shame with having to use a laxative. It's, it's actually important for you because you want to have daily elimination. In terms of the nutritional suggestions, I think that um, again, if you've heard me speak about nutrition and scleroderma, the first thing I usually say is that there's no one diet that's right for everyone, and this I firmly believe. But there are some suggestions that I make for all patients because I think it can benefit everyone, uh, patients without scleroderma and, and patients with scleroderma. So processed foods. Processed foods are essentially foods where chemicals and preservatives get added to the food to change the flavor or the color or prolong the shelf life. When these get added, it can actually be difficult for your body to process these, right? Because it's not a normal food substance. And there's been studies demonstrating that these processed foods can disrupt your um, gut bacterial balance, may cause inflammation. So here are some examples here, um, processed meats like hot dogs, bacon, potato chips, a lot of frozen meals. Um, these are ones where, again, we have a lot of these foods in the US, but they're really not very healthy for you. So a simple way to know, okay, is a food processed or not? And you can do this today in your kitchen is just open up your, your cupboard or your cabinet. And if you have a food that's in a box or in a package, look at the number of ingredients. And if there's five or less ingredients, it's probably pretty safe for you to have. But if you start looking at the ingredient list and it's growing, growing, and then half the things on there are things you can't even pronounce the names of because they're long chemical names, this is probably a processed food that you want to avoid. And usually processed foods will have a lot of added sugars to them. So, you know, our, our labels, at least in the U.S., will say the, the number of sugar, grams of sugar, but it will also say added sugars. So it's okay if something naturally has sugar, like a fruit will naturally have sugar, that's okay. But if you're eating something where 20 additional grams of sugar are added, that's something you'd want to avoid. And then I mentioned the probiotics because this is one strategy for kind of improving the balance of gut bacteria. Um, and, and there's ways to do this naturally with food. So the, the milk products, and again, it doesn't have to be cow's milk products. It could be almond milk, coconut milk, soy milk. Um, pickled vegetables are another good source of healthy probiotics. And a lot of these things you can make um, by yourself at home. Prebiotics are also important, and prebiotics are basically uh, fibers that go through your intestines undigested, but the good healthy bacteria feed off of these and it can help them grow. So here are some examples of foods that have a high level of prebiotics. And again, all of these foods not, might not be right for you, but if there's a couple on here that you like, it may be worth trying. And then in terms of treatment of the anal rectum, this is a really tricky area. And I would say it's, it's complicated for a number of reasons. One is that sometimes patients don't feel comfortable talking to their doctor about this because it's a really private matter. There's also the reverse of that, that sometimes doctors don't ask patients. And so I think that just having a better dialogue with your doctor about these issues is sort of the first step in terms of treatment. Um, I prescribe a lot of pelvic physical therapy to my patients because I find this, you know, can be very helpful in strengthening the muscles of the pelvic floor. Um, and if you don't have someone near you that's specializing in this, there's a lot of physical therapists now that do things through Zoom that you may be able to find in a different area. Um, sometimes we implant sacral nerve stimulators that can help with anal rectal dysfunction. Um, if patients have fecal incontinence, we sometimes use anti-diarrheal agents like loperamide. And then other things like biofeedback can be very helpful too. So to summarize, um, any part of the GI tract can be involved in systemic sclerosis. And these are some of the most common symptoms listed here. So dysphagia reflux, 
early satiety, bloating, even bleeding, pseudo obstruction, malabsorption, weight loss, diarrhea, constipation, as well as fecal incontinence and even rectal prolapse. So I encourage you to speak with your doctor about your GI symptoms, even if it's not one of the questions they routinely ask you because there's a whole lot to cover, I'm sure, in all of your visits. This is something you really should speak up about. And GI studies can help identify the specific cause of your symptoms. And doing these studies can often help the doctors then tailor the treatment to picking the right treatment for you. But this is really a condition that requires a multidisciplinary approach to care. So it's not just medications, it's making lifestyle changes, modifying your nutrition, all of these things combined could help improve your quality of life if you have GI tract involvement with scleroderma. So I wanna thank you again for listening and I think we're actually just right on time to get into the Q&A session. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Boltman. That was an incredibly detailed talk. Um, I think that will resonate with a lot of people. Um, it's it's not just me. Um, we have some lovely feedback coming through. Um, I'll, um, Alexandra says, thank you for giving such a, an important talk. So that, that's really nice, nice feedback. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, if you do have a question that you would like to ask Dr. Volkman, um, you can do this via the Q&A function. Um, if you hover over Q&A in, in the Zoom window, um, you can type your question in there and I will put it forward to Doc, Dr. Volkman on your behalf. Um, we've, th there's now 120 people joining us. Um, wow. I know, it's brilliant um, for, for, for the session. And we do have quite a few questions. Um, the first one, it, it's an anonymous question and it's come through on the Q&A. Why does S SSC cause gastrointestinal issues? That's a great question. And I think, you know, because we are focused on symptoms, diagnosis and management, we couldn't get to the cause. Um, but there are um, different causes of GI tract involvement. So we think that um, it's sort of a complex interplay of different factors. So one factor is there's a vasculopathy, meaning that there's probably a change in the blood vessels. So you all are probably familiar with Raynaud phenomenon where you get lack of blood flow to your extremities, your hands, your feet. There's probably a lack of blood flow to the gut. And this can also cause issues with how the blood, the, the gut moves. We think that there's changes that happen with the autonomic nervous system. This is the, the nervous system that controls, you know, rest, digestion, relaxation. Um, in addition, you can get fibrosis, so inflammation that leads to scarring in the gut wall, and we think that this also causes the muscles to waste away. So it, it's complicated, and it's not so easy to, um, again, to diagnose, but we think that these three factors, the inflammation, fibrosis, the nerve changes, and the blood vessel changes are what are contributing to the GI tract involvement in scleroderma. Another anonymous question. Um, what are the primary causes of nausea in scleroderma, please? That's another great question. And um, there's a lot of different causes of nausea in scleroderma. So one of them I mentioned during the talk was if you have delayed gastric emptying, if things aren't moving out of the stomach fast enough and then you're eating, it can actually make you feel nauseous because the nausea is like something rising up, right, from not moving quick enough. But there's other causes too that are important to consider. And, and one common one is a medication side effect. So sometimes the medications that we use to treat scleroderma can also cause GI symptoms. And it can be sometimes tricky to figure out, is this due to the underlying scleroderma or this, is this due to a medication? And sometimes medications like mycophenolate, um, which is commonly prescribed for scleroderma, this can cause nausea. So there's there's different possibilities. Thank you very much. Um, this is sort of a lifestyle question. Um, it's about taste in the mouth. Um, um, th this, this person describes a horrible, salty, rotten taste 24 seven. Um, is this likely to be a neurological part of Sjogren's or is it a gut effect? Of, 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 of reflux? 
Right. That's a great question too. And I think it could be either or, or even both. So oftentimes people that have reflux will report kind of a bad taste in their mouth. And if this is happening for you at specific times, like after eating or waking up in the morning, then it might be more related to reflux. But if it's there all of the time, it could also be related to having, you know, dry mouth um, and even issues with, you know, dental hygiene. Is, um, this is kind of a compliment, but I think it's it's a general question as well about accessing care. Um, someone is asking, where does Dr. Volkman practice? I need a good doctor. <laughs> <That's> I practice. <laughs> okay. How do you find a good doctor? How do you find a good doctor? No, it's a great, great question. So I practice in Los Angeles, and I would say that um, probably a good place to start, and, and maybe you can chime in on this as well, is I'm sure on your website, you have information about the doctors in your area that specialize in scleroderma. And we have this in the US, um, we have a scleroderma foundation and you can put in where you live, your zip code, and it will tell you your closest, we call them scleroderma centers for excellence where they have doctors who specialize in scleroderma. So that's that's one way. I would also say that I think the one of the, the <laughs> silver linings of the pandemic is that it's improved our ability to do telehealth so even if you don't physically live close to um, an expert in scleroderma, there's sometimes now ways to connect with them virtually. So I do a lot of telehealth appointments with patients where I don't see them in person, but we do things through this kind of Zoom platform. So that may be a possibility for you if you're not geographically close to any experts. Um, um, I love a lovely question. Um, thank you very much for this excellent seminar. Um, if, um, is it possible to ask if scleroderma can be caused because of a leaky gut? Yeah, so leaky gut is something that um, probably happens in some patients with scleroderma. And, and what this means is that um, normally your intestines act as kind of a barrier. What you eat and all the bacteria in your gut should stay in your gut and not sort of move out into the body. And we think that what happens sometimes when there's a imbalance in gut bacteria is that it can break down the, the proteins, the barriers that keep that wall intact. And then we think that inflammation can leak out. So it's probably, it may not be the cause so much, but it probably happens in many patients. And it likely happens early in the course of the disease. So um, we recently published a paper where we looked at the gut microbiome in patients with very early scleroderma. And this was a group of patients, not just in the US, but in Sweden also. And even patients who had very early scleroderma had changes in their gut bacteria balance. So again, I'm not sure if it's the cause of scleroderma, but it definitely is something that probably happens early in the course of the disease. Thank you very much. Um, it is quite common with small intestine bacterial overgrowth not to be able to tolerate pro and prebiotics or laxatives. And is there a way around this? Can anything be, be done to help, please? I think it's very, it's different for every patient. So the question is, you know, if you have small intestine bacterial overgrowth, is it common that you can't tolerate any of the, the treatments that we do? I think in terms of probiotics and prebiotics, if you're taking a supplement, um, that's something where you have to be a little bit careful because at least where I am, these supplements are not regulated. So you actually don't know exactly what you're getting. And if you're getting a, a huge amount of bacteria and you already have bacterial overgrowth in a supplement, you may not feel better when you take it. That's why I usually recommend getting your probiotics and prebiotics kind of naturally through food because you're getting small amounts and the, the right amount and the way nature intended you to get it. Um, and then in terms of laxatives, sometimes it's just a matter of finding the right one. There's, there's all different ones. There's stimulant laxatives, there's osmotic laxatives. I would say the osmotic laxatives are ones that kind of draw water into the gut to help you go and it's kind of stool softening. Sometimes these can be difficult for people to tolerate if they have bacterial overgrowth and they do better with the stimulant laxative. So there can be some fine tuning, so it may not be you can't tolerate any laxative, it could just be a certain kind. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got a question about symptoms and this is really about the impact of symptoms on daily life. Um, 
I wake up in the morning feeling as though I've had a three course meal, so very full, very bloated and nauseous. I take Lansoprol and Domperidone just before bedtime and I don't eat after seven o'clock. Um, is there any other way to ease these symptoms, please? Yeah, that's a good good question. And again, I, I um, appreciate how difficult this can be and, and how hard it can be. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes you might have to eat even earlier in the day. I do have some patients that have to avoid eating after 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So I, I try to encourage patients to do most of their eating early in the day because once you lay down at night, if you have problems with motility, delayed gastric emptying, you're going to have difficulty so one could be shifting the time that you eat. And then, you know, the Domperidone is a, another promotility agent. Um, it's not available in the U.S., so we don't use it too much here. Um, but the Procalipride is something that I, I prefer. Um, and so that might be something to explore, too, to talk to your doctor to see if that would be an option for you. Um, Another one is Linzess, um, and this one sometimes can cause a little bit of diarrhea. So again, it's sometimes trial and error finding the right medication for you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any advice on how to manage how to manage severe pseudo obstruction that is caused by scleroderma, please? So pseudo obstruction can be really difficult. Um, you know, patients sometimes go to the hospital because they have such bad pseudo obstruction symptoms. So this is essentially when, again, the gut will twist and things don't move. And if you try to eat, you can have nausea, vomiting, um, a lot of abdominal distension. And what we usually recommend is bowel rest. So whether it's in the hospital or outside of the hospital, you want to rest the gut. And usually with, with resting the gut, um, things will eventually untwist and get better. But during that time, you need to make sure you're getting adequate hydration. So that's why we often have people go into the hospital so that we can make sure they're getting fluids so that they don't get dehydrated in this process. Um, if you frequently suffer from pseudo obstruction, the other thing that I think might be helpful is um, doing abdominal massage. <laughs> And this may sound funny, but um, sometimes just doing, um, you know, again, your stomach is like um, you want to be going in this direction, right? And so um, if you do some massage, you can do self-massage. Sometimes there are massage therapists that focus on abdominal massage um, or physical therapists. But this could be something, again, you want to just make sure things are moving in the right way. I also sometimes advise patients to put... Um, like a heating pad on their stomach, again, to help improve blood flow to that area. Um, you also never want to eat when you feel cold, right? Because all the blood is not going to be going to help digest your food. So warmth and, and things like this massage, these are simple things that might, might help reduce the risk of having pseudo obstruction. Thank you very much. Um, We've had a couple of questions come in about the FODMAP diet. Um, someone has asked if it's for life. Um, another person has asked, um, is it possible to stay on a low FODMAP diet if it substantially improves symptoms and the reintroduction of other foods? Is it okay to start with and then it causes problems again? The alternative seems to be taking antibiotics on a regular basis. I believe this is also not good. Please, can you help? Yeah. Great, great question. Um, and so what the FODMAP diet is, is you're basically eating foods that are low in FODMAPs. And FODMAPs basically are substances like they're carbohydrates that go through your body undigested. And many patients who have bacterial overgrowth and problems with motility, if they have too many FODMAPs, they can get a lot of bloating and distension. Um, and so the low FODMAP diet was really designed to be used kind of short term to help eliminate all high FODMAP foods. And then the idea was to try to slowly reintroduce certain foods. And, and what I would say is that when you think about this process, um, yeah, some patients will have to be on low FODMAP forever. But I would say more often I'll have patients where they discover over time there's certain foods that have higher FODMAPs that they actually can tolerate if they cook them a different way. So for example, like asparagus and artichoke, these are very difficult to eat raw, but if you cook them, if you have them pureed or in a soup or steamed, oftentimes you can tolerate small amounts. So what I would say is that if, if someone has told you go on the low FODMAP diet, 
you know, you don't necessarily have to be on that very strict diet forever. You can try to incorporate some of the foods in and maybe try cooking them well um, to see if that helps you tolerate them. Because it's a very restrictive diet and you also want to make sure that you're getting all the, the vitamins and nutrients that you need when you have scleroderma. If you stick to just no FODMAP, you're going to really limit the number of fruits and vegetables you eat. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's come through on another channel, but somebody has asked, is it possible to ask Dr. Boltman to talk a little bit more about the connection between scleroderma and gastroparesis, please? Yeah, so the gastroparesis is another um, way to say delayed gastric emptying. And basically what we think happens is that there's a, a disconnect. You know, normally when the stomach gets food, it should start to empty properly. And we think that there's a you know a misconnection with the nerves where it kind of moves more slowly. So this is this is what can happen in some patients with scleroderma. About 30% of patients can get gastroparesis. And for this, we recommend again doing the small frequent meals because if the stomach moves more slowly, you don't want to overload it with food at one particular time. And the the pro motility agents like the procalipride, the domperidone, this might help with the improved gastric emptying too. very much yeah. um somebody has asked a question about probiotics um yeah. about starting probiotics um um i would like to start taking probiotics and prebiotics where do i start and how much should i take please yeah this is a difficult question because again this is a there's very few pharmaceutical grade probiotics so if you're taking a supplement sometimes you don't know exactly what you're taking um, and it's interesting when we've done studies looking at gut bacteria in patients with scleroderma, uh, we and other people throughout the world who now do this have found that patients with scleroderma have higher levels of lactobacillus, a specific type of bacteria, compared to patients without scleroderma. But if you look at the most of the probiotic supplements that are available, oftentimes they're high in lactobacillus. Another one is bifidobacterium. So I'm not sure if we have the right probiotic yet for scleroderma. And this is why we're trying to do research on the gut microbiome to figure out, okay, what bacteria are low in scleroderma and could we develop a pill that would help replace it? So I think the currently available probiotics, you can try them um, and see how you feel. And if it helps you, obviously continue taking it. But if it doesn't help you, I would then encourage you to try to eat more foods that are naturally rich in probiotics, because then you're gonna get more than just one strain of, of bacteria, like just lactobacillus or just bifidobacterium. You're gonna get a broad range if you're eating cultured foods. Thank you very much. Um, you touched on um, fetal incontinence during your presentation. Um, we've had some comments um, coming in on the Q&A, mainly saying thank you for talking about it. One lady says, you, you've given me the confidence to go and see my, my doctor about it. So thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's resonated with a lot of people. We do have a question. Um, someone is asking, I, I have been advised that, that my rectal muscle is good, but I still get fetal incontinence. Um, why could this be, please? Yeah, and, and that can be tricky. Even when the muscle is intact, sometimes there can be misfiring of the nerves. So again, that, that autonomic nervous system that controls digestion can sometimes become dysfunctional. And in this case, I think something like biofeedback could be very helpful. It's sort of retraining the connection between your, your brain and your gut. You know, there's a whole nervous system in your gut. And so biofeedback can be very helpful. Um, I would still consider the, the pelvic floor physiology uh, or physiotherapy, I think it's what you call it there, physical therapy, um, because again, this can also help even strengthen the muscles, even if they are intact, but the biofeedback might be the, the most helpful for you in this situation. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question about diet. Um, thank you. Very interesting and informative. You mentioned gluten-free oats as opposed to regular oats. Um, would going gluten-free be helpful? Um, I've tried it and it didn't really improve my symptoms. Yeah, I would say that again, there's, there's no one diet for patients with scleroderma. I have some patients who feel a lot better when they don't eat much gluten, others where it doesn't make a very big difference. I think some of it has to do with a lot of the foods that have gluten can be highly processed foods. So those gluten 
foods, you know, I would try to avoid. And if you're eating um, raw oats, like most people do okay with it. Some people have to do the gluten free. But if you go and you get packages of oatmeal, again, a lot of them have added sugar and things like this. So just, I think more important than the gluten free is just making sure it's not processed oats, just the, the raw oats that you would then cook. But in terms of the gluten free, it's, it's, it's different for everyone. Some people do better with it. Some people don't. I have just been diagnosed with dysmotility. Can this be cured and what can I take to help it get, get better? Thank you very much. Yeah, um, dysmotility is something we don't currently have a cure for. Um, we have medications that can help improve motility, but this doesn't necessarily get at the root cause of what's causing the dysmotility. And I think that um, we're trying to do more research to figure out the cause, you know, because we typically don't use like when we treat skin disease and scleroderma or lung disease, we'll use medications that reduce inflammation or reduce fibrosis. We currently don't do that for GI disease, but we're trying to do more research now to figure out maybe we should be doing that. You know, maybe it's just because we can't see the gut like we can see the lungs with a CT scan. Maybe we should be giving anti-inflammatory. So I hope that, you know, a few years from now, I have a better answer for you. But right now we don't have a cure. We just have medications that can help improve the symptoms of dysmotility. Thank you very much. Um, someone is asking about digestive enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, if that's okay, the question is, would digestive enzymes help with absorbing nutrients that we don't absorb from, from B12? Right. Good question. So um, the pancreas is the part of the GI tract that produces enzymes and they get secreted when you eat to help you, again, break down the food. Um, the problem with the digestive enzymes that are commercially available, like through supplements, is that you don't actually know if you know the stomach can actually the acid can break down the 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 enzymes. So you don't know it needs to get beyond the stomach into the small intestine for it to work. Um, so I don't know if the currently available supplements like the enzymes actually get to where they need to be. Uh, they may. There's there's pharmaceutical grade enzymes that people have to take who, for example, don't have a pancreas or their pancreas doesn't function properly. Um, so this is this is probably more effective, but they're they're quite expensive. Another option, um, again, I I prefer simple things and and not expensive supplements. Um, is certain foods have naturally higher levels of enzymes in them. So for example. Um, papaya, I don't know if you have papaya there, but it's a tropical fruit um, and it has something called papain in it and this is a natural enzyme. So if you eat the papaya, you're going to get some of that enzyme. Um, onions have some too. So I think I would try to get it more naturally through food because I worry that if you take the supplement, it might not be getting to the place where it needs to get in the GI tract. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of time, but we do have um, a question about watermelon stomach, which um, I know came up in the presentation. The question is, is there anything that antagonizes watermelon stomach? Any particular food, drinking alcohol, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think that um, one thing, if you have watermelon stomach, I mean, this can be a quite serious. And so I would try to, in these cases, avoid any kind of food that would further promote the production of acid. So these would be like the citrus fruits, the tomatoes, anything spicy, all the kind of foods that were listed on that, that chart I showed for reflux, they could be aggravating for a watermelon stomach um, alcohol too. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, this is about lower esophageal sphincter. Um, is, is relaxed lower esophageal sphincter the same as lax cardia? That's not a term I recognize, actually, the second one. Lax cardia. Yeah, I don't think that's the same thing. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are quite short of time. We have had some questions come through over other channels as well. Um, this is quite general, but um, 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 this is about natural therapies. Are there any natural therapies that you could recommend to help with symptoms such as pain, reflux, and urgency? So I suppose the general GI symptoms that a lot of people experience, are there any natural therapies that might help, I, I suppose, aside from the probiotics? Right, yeah, it's a great question. And I think that, again, it's gonna be different for different people. And um, I think if you're gonna explore natural remedies, it's helpful to go 
to a provider that has some understanding of scleroderma. So if they're a naturopath or a traditional Chinese medicine doctor that they've worked with patients with scleroderma before, and also they're willing to work with your your existing doctor. Um, but some herbs, I think I mentioned one, the chamomile. So a simple thing is like chamomile tea. The chamomile is a herb that kind of is cooling and it helps kind of move things down. So if you have issues with reflux, it's like heat coming up. Chamomile is like a cooling herb and that's something that's very accessible um, that you can get. Another one is lemon balm as well. So um, there's simple things that you can do yourself, but I think if you're going to go down the route of trying herbal remedies, then I would definitely go to someone that's well-trained and also has experience treating patients with scleroderma. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, but we have had some absolutely lovely feedback, and I'd like to share some of that, that with you. Um, so helpful, excellent talk, vital information. That's from Pamela. This is an uh, anonymous comment. Thank you for such a great talk. Thank you for your clear answers. Um, thank you for answering my questions so clearly. I think today has been really much appreciated by a lot of people. So thank, thank you very much. I'm so sorry that we that we we've, we've run out of time today. Um, I I'm, I apologise if we didn't get get to get to answer all the questions. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to Dr. Volkman for for giving up your time to be with us today and for answering the questions in such clear detail. Um, I can see that's been very much appreciated. Um, we've had a number of comments asking me to to say thank you as well. Um, thank you all for your company today. If you do find our webinars helpful and you would like to support the work of SRUK, you can do so by texting SRUK webinar, that's SRUK webinar, or one word, to 70450. That's SRUK webinar to 70450. And this will make a £5 donation plus one standard network rate message. Alternatively, please visit sruk.co.uk. Um, I think all that remains now is for, for me to say thank you once again to Dr. Boltman. The comments are still coming in and they're all really positive. I, I wish I had time to read them to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And thank all of you for tuning in today. I, um, I applaud you for taking the time. Again, this is a difficult part of the experience with scleroderma. So I just encourage you to speak up to your doctors and tell them how you feel and, and you know, ask them questions because again, sometimes this gets overlooked, but it's very important. So thank you again for allowing me to speak today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone who's joined us today. Thank you again. Goodbye. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>